And we're back at day 76. Uh, you can see I'm here at home. I uh, ran out of glass. <laughs> and I had to come make some more. I didn't have quite enough on me to finish my uh, project. Uh, I was right before. I was definitely doing it wrong. There was a uh, much easier method to go about laying down my glass. And I was, uh, I figured it out. You can see now, coming up on this, that I've got, well, I hope you can see it in the quality, crappy quality video that YouTube uses. Um, I've got some glass already down there. You can see it in the background, under the water there. Um, I noticed that when I was laying down the grass, the light in the game has a, uh, a unique method of actually traveling through glass when it's in water. So it's like it lights up just having the glass because it comes all the way to the surface. So you can see I've got most of the ring complete. Uh, I've got a few hiccups down there where I've, I got the height of the sand wrong, but it'll all be adjusted once I get done laying down the glass, which is what I'm going to do now. Uh, you can see here, I figured out it was much faster if I just placed the glass while climbing up in the water, uh, swimming upwards in the water. It's uh, significantly more efficient and it doesn't take. It's a lot better than trying to walk along the bottom of the water because that just was not working. So, almost got it complete. Of course, uh, once I do actually get it complete, I get the uh, nice lengthy task of um, draining out all the water, and that's going to be a, a nightmare and a half. Uh, which reminds me of a um, a mod I saw recently on YouTube, and. Uh, it's not a new mod, like it's been out for many months now, but it's the first time I've ever run across it. And uh, I'll go ahead and include a link for it in the description when I'm done. Uh, but it's called Finite Water, and it you know, it's a, uh, makes the water in the game not infinite, it's like it can't self-regenerate the way it does now. And you can't just make infinite water blocks. So it's, it's an interesting way to consider a, consider playing. I mean, your ocean is still a nearly limitless source of water because it's just such a, an insane volume. But, um... It would make something like this easier because it had a, uh, like, a pump and drain system. So I can literally, like, pump the water out of my enclosure now that it's sealed. And, uh pump it back into the ocean on the other side, which would be handy. But instead, I'm going to have to fill up just about every last inch of it with sand. So, it's going to be a little time consuming. Uh, I'm going to do at least one cut away, because uh, this is just going to be ridiculous. Like, this is literally going to take days of game time to uh, get it all done. And I guess it's already day 76, and uh, it was 73 in the last video. And so it took me a full extra day just to get the glass done before I was here. And uh, I think I'll be into the 80s by the time the uh, this video is complete, considering how long it's going to be, too. There's just so much to get done. So we'll go ahead and uh, start moving on to a little more interesting topics than placing sand, because this is just going to be repetitive. Feel free to watch <laughs> uh, and enjoy the uh, repetitiveness of it. Um, I was going to continue on with my my discussion of my uh, top ten RPGs. Um, I went over Xenogears and Vagrant Story, and. Um, I know I briefly touched on Super Mario RPG. It was one of the ones on my list. Um, another one on my list is Legend of Dragoon. Um, I don't know if anyone's even familiar with this game. It didn't get nearly as much press as it probably should have. Uh, I mean, if you're in into RPGs and you were around during like the birth of the PlayStation era. You know, when you started out, you might be familiar with it. It's like telling people about Wild Arms. Like, uh, if you weren't around near the beginning of the PlayStation era, you probably aren't familiar with Wild Arms either. I mean, there were a few 
PS2 games that came out, but it just it didn't really catch on. It was a very unique splitting of the RPG genre because it had a, a like a very Wild West kind of feel to it. And I don't mean like the way it's like uh, Gun or any of the other Rockstar Western adventures are, but uh, it was a uh, Legend of Dragoon was made in-house by Sony. It was one of their own productions. And it was an ambitious title, I would say. Um, it had some real flaws. Like, it was extremely cliched. Uh, but at the same time, it still had interesting plot. Like, it was... And it, it started out with, you know, your hero comes back from a long journey, and immediately the girl he's interested in is kidnapped, right? And so you're on one of those kind of starting scenarios. And it's like, oh, well, I've been here and done that. Because <laughs> uh, that's just not exciting. And then, so you chase off after the baddies, and you, you know, discover your girl has some sort of secret hidden power thing, and you slowly get involved in this, you know, big world spanning, save the world kind of quest thing. Just like a lot of RPGs do. But what really made, in my opinion, made Legend of Dragoon shine and why it's on my top 10 is specifically because of its battle system. Um, like Vagrant Story, uh, Legend of Dragoon featured a uh, time-sensitive contact pre contact con time-sensitive context buttons, uh, kind of like the way uh, the God of War cutscenes are, and, and it was taken in the mini games nowadays. You see everywhere, but it was. Um, In battle, you could, it was just like, you had to hit your sequence of attacks and time your button presses, and if you didn't, you wouldn't land your actual full strength attacks in battle, and so it was, it was one of the, it was, you know, this game came out prior to Vagrant Story, so it was the first time I'd experienced this in an RPG that actually had, you know, an active component to battle. And, because how often do you, I mean, even in RPGs today, battles are rarely an active component. You know, RPGs always follow the traditional formula of select your attacks, uh, execute your attacks, and everything's all manually handled by the system. It's never, you know, you're attacking, it's the system is executing your commands. So... It's never quite perfect. Uh, so, but this was like interesting because you'd have to actually be engaged in your battle. You couldn't just let the uh, the system handle your auto attacks for you. As you, uh, you know, you couldn't just you know say, "Oh, I want you to do this attack, this attack, that attack," and then it would just do it. I mean, so it was it it, it kept you playing. You didn't have to, you know, sort of be half paying attention, half not. I mean, I can't, I loved Fossey 7, but I can't count the amount of times I was in battle, and all I did was just hold down the, the accept button, you know? And so it would just, you know, play the, you could go through regular attacks over and over to the monster was dead, and that was all I did. And there was no actual thinking or thought involved. It was just, you know, execute the attack, execute the attack, execute the attack. So that was what really made this game something special. Uh, at least at the start, and then what made it better is that it it followed after Final Fantasy VII, and it went really big on its uh, full motion videos, and it had you know it was like one of the first games aside from Seven that like really pushed the video component to RPGs like that, and. It was an, an, an impressively large amount of uh, quality 
Like, it was... Like, Square Enix quality before Square Enix had the quality they do in their videos. Like, um... You know, a lot of the videos in 7 were all kind of... iffy. Like, it, it was clever, but it wasn't... Like, top of the line, wow, this is an amazing feat of technology. You know, they were the very early days of CG generation. And, I say the very early, they were rather early days anyways, they weren't the early days. But, uh, because those things, the really early days were hideous, that stuff was just gross. <laughs> but, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but it was, it was they, they incorporated the story elements. They weren't just flash and flare. They actually sort of fit with the game. And then it had, you know, your standard, you know, set of plot twists and elements that made it unique and unlike other games. So I, I appreciate that as a gamer, that, you know, you have those games that go that extra distance to be a little, despite being cliche, it has not predictable plot flow. Like, there's too many games you play, it's like, oh, well, I expect this is where the bad guy's going to appear, and this is where such and such type of plot device will be added in. And you just sort of, eventually you you get so accustomed to RPGs, especially the traditional JRPGs as they're classified now. You know, they're just the old school, that's just the way the RPGs were back then kind of thing. And they're not that way anymore. Um... Uh, even the uh, the JRPGs are evolving to be something new, something different than they used to be. But this game, I mean, for being made completely by you know a uh, you know, a foreign Japanese publisher, and yet not seem like your traditional Japanese RPG was was it was it was nice. I mean, it was nice to see that extra mile to make it relate and different and interesting. So, you can see here I've run out of sand, so now I've got to dig up what I've already put down, minus the wall, and uh, collect it so that I can repurpose it to clear up more water. I couldn't possibly, I don't even think I can carry enough sand on my character to completely fill this area. It's just, it's a massive amount of area and it will consume a ton of sand. Thankfully, I will get most of it all back. Um, some of the very bottom will end up staying, but the rest of it I'll get to keep. So it's just the, uh, the tools that will be used up quite extensively. Die, piggy. Oop, had a shovel. I don't know, and uh, I don't know. Legend of Dragoon was, it was something different, like, um, it had an element which reminded me a lot of Xenogears, like, of course, I played Xenogears, Xenogears came out after Legend of Dragoon, but I played Legend of Dragoon, I think, after Xenogears, because of when I purchased it, but it, um, I'm gonna cut away here and just come back when I'm nearly done. Here we are, it's been uh, six days, five days, I don't know, it's been several days. And as you can see, I've got most of it done here. So I'm going to finish filling in this hole and uh, get things going. Um, what the hell was I talking about? <laughs> I got all distracted by cutting away. Uh, what do you think? backtrack, uh, so my memory's not great, I forget that fast, I'm just must be getting really old, uh, <laughs> um, Jesus, wow, wow, I really did forget, I know I was talking, oh, Battle Element similar to Pacino Gears, right, so, um, the game had, um, Like, you had two states of your battle. You were either, you know, in normal battle, or you were a Dragoon in the game's 
uh, definition of that that class. Like it, it meant something. Like to be a dragoon was was magical and it had bearing, and you had access to special abilities you normally wouldn't have had access to. And so it allowed the dynamic of battles to shift as you, like, you know, kind of like, you know, a uh, going Super Saiyan kind of thing. Like you said, only you're, you know, you're more powerful and you can do more stuff. And it's just, it's a whole new ball game suddenly. So I, I, I like that. It was an interesting way to engross a player. And... So it makes me uh, really like it. Like I said, it's on my top ten. If you haven't ever played it, I really do recommend it. Um, let's see, that covers the two. We've got Xenogears, Vagrant Story, Legend of Dragoon, Super Mario RPG, and Shadowrun I've covered. So five of my ten already. Um, let's go ahead and move on to my next one of my next favorites. And that would be Final Fantasy Tactics. If you've not had a chance to play Final Fantasy Tactics, find a way to do so. It's... I, I've never been a real big fan of strategic battle. And that's really what it is. It's, it's a strategic battle. Like you, you have to plan out your moves and... The door was put down for the air and, you know, set up your, your, your scenarios for battle, it's, it, I mean, it's, it had traditional RPG play, but it was across a, a battlefield, you had to do space, you had to plan out your movements, because you could only move so much, and then you could only attack so much, and so you had to make it fit, so that was important out here and connect the tunnel now. Don't drown, don't drown. Okay. Um, so it was the, my first entry into tactical combat in an RPG. Like, I had never experienced it. At least not on that level. Like, I had experienced what's the word I'm looking for? I had experienced and I'm about to drown. Okay, here it is. Um, I'd experienced, you know, the type of tactical planning that goes into, you know, using materia properly in Fantasy 7, or, you know, the kind of thing that goes into, you know, just setting up a sequence of, of, of attacks you can, uh, you know, heal and attack, and giving done in a brown. But this was the first time that you had to, like, work with units, and each unit had its own different strengths, and it's, it's very much, you know, your tactical combat, and I liked it because you didn't see that hardly ever in an RPG, like, it was the first time I'd ever encountered that. I know other games like it existed, like, um, what was it called, uh, um, Tactics Ogre was, a, a game, and then, uh, that had a similar battle system. And there was uh, Vandal Hearts. They all came out around the same time, and they did the same sort of systems. They were all a little variant of each other, but they more or less the same system. But what really made Fancy Tactics shine was its story. I mean, it was, you know, the, the APOC of Squaresoft, back when they were the APOC, the EPOC, I don't know how to say that, but... Uh, you know, Squaresoft used to be known specifically for that. It was their story that made them what they were. They were storytellers, first and foremost. And it didn't always stay that way, and it's changed over the years. But back then, with the release of Final Fantasy Tactics, it was definitely the top of their game. And the amount of intrigue in their their, like, religion, science, conflict of, you know, that starts out as this sort of traditional 
medieval plot, like, um, I say medieval, like it was, it had a very much a, what's the word, um, like, just, um, like, a competition of countries, like, you know, warlike battle, I mean, it makes you, kind of reminds me of, like, uh, like movies like Braveheart, where you've got all the, you know, the this entity versus that entity kind of things going on, and there was more to it than that, obviously, but that was kind of where the idea fit. It was, you know, you worked for, you were the son of a noble house, and you get involved with mercenaries after some sort of personal falling out, and your best friend who disappeared on you shows up all of a sudden and he's not necessarily working for an enemy but he's working for an independent party that you're that isn't associated with you or your house and it's one of those like and it just spirals out of control into this interesting deep plot uh involving like gods and the uh, the founding religion of the nation and whatnot, and it's just it's it's really interesting uh, the amount of detail they put in it is really interesting. I mean, I really really enjoyed it. It was uh, definitely one of a kind, or I say, what's that one of a kind, I don't I haven't played uh, Tactics Advanced or the, uh, the other, Tactics 2 Advanced or whatever, so I don't know if they have the same feel or not, but, uh, I don't know, it, it was, it was a really good game that had a story unlike anything else I'd ever encountered, and so it was, it was fun because you really got into the the political back going. It's like your own character as the son of a noble house was like at odds with other houses and then still eventually at odds with his own house over decisions that were made and you end up leading your own little band of mercenaries and get involved in this conflict that ends up becoming you know, save the world in proportion, but it's never, like, utterly cliched the same way a lot of other RPGs are, like, you don't have that, oh, well, that's an obvious directionality for this storyline to flow, it was more like, wow, I would have, you know, never expected I would be in this kind of scenario instead of what actually, you know, ends up happening, and it's just, it's, it's kind of wild, like, it's, I, it's, like I said, it's different, and I love different. Different's great because different makes you think, and different, you know, gives you another reason to be intrigued and to follow along and to get into the deep element of that story. So, so different's a good thing, especially when it comes to story. Because everybody wants something new, and nothing's better than getting the ability, getting the chance to experience a story that had never been played out that way before. So I really recommend giving Policy Tactics a play. It's a very time-consuming game. You will spend a significant amount of your hours playing through it. Uh, I mean that in that it takes a long time to beat and get through because it's a long game. It's got a lot of story and a lot of battles to cover, and you will have to engage in, it's got little money-making, uh, I don't want to call them schemes, but it's got, you know, these devices where you have to work in, there's like trade, uh, like you take on odd jobs, and through the course of these jobs, you pick up at like bars, hear rumors, and people seeking mercenaries for things, and you don't actually do the odd jobs, is what's interesting, like, you send your, your mercenaries, your little band out to do them, and so you have to, like, 
be careful and be and use skilled people. It was like you send out someone that's weak and injured, and there's a you know a slim possibility they may not come back because it was one of the few times in an RPG where, aside from yourself, any character was dispend, uh, expendable. Like you could literally kill off just about anyone. And it would, you know, the, the game would, you know, cut them out of dialogue sequences and, you know, they just would not be a part of things anymore. <laughs> you know, but it had a, uh, like, you would fall in battle and you had, like, a set number of turns to revive your ally. And if you didn't revive your ally within time, their body would basically just decompose and disappear into the nothing. And you are now short that ally for the remainder of your game. Short of reloading. Which, if you lost a prize ally, was probably a better idea. Because you don't want to lose the good ones, because they're definitely, you know, the, uh, there's all, you, know, you can always recruit in the game, uh, new allies and train them up. Like, uh, every time you go to town, you could hit up a local bar and hire other mercenaries to join your, your little escapade. And you had to pay a base fee to uh, get them enlisted. And then after they were enlisted, they would use their abilities and capabilities to aid in your battle. And they would level as you used to, just like any other RPG character. So it was it was interesting. Uh, the mechanics, like they, they allowed you to go that extra mile and make something out of nothing. Like that, I like it just it really pushed the uh, the storyline to something new because of the gameplay experience that came with it. So that's 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 why it's on my must play list. That's why it's one of the top ten RPGs I've ever played. There's always that something that makes it different or new or unique, and that's where the difference lies. sand and put the rest of my cobble down and I need to extend the, uh, the, the sand around the base to be too deep. I don't know how much that I'm going to get done. Up to the top. Let's grab my lanterns real quick. Jack o lanterns. Almost like a Pokeball arena. Check a lantern, I choose you. Like I said, still far, far, far from complete. There is a lot more that will need to be done on this structure. Uh, a lot more. I mean, I don't even. Uh, it's just up to the water level at the moment, and there's still no way to get up here. Uh, eventually, like, you will only be able to get up here from below, uh, through the tunnel. Like, I don't want to have any external access to this, this structure, uh, short of going underwater and swimming back through it. Under, uh, you can always get up through the water, but I don't want to, what's the word? 
I don't want to leave any potential access for monsters at all. They're not allowed in this in this area. So, but I'm gonna need glass, still quite a bit more glass and wood to build the upper structure. It's gonna go on top. So, but we'll save that for next time because uh, you know, this has gone way too long already. We uh, head back home here now. It's getting all dark. Well, I hope you found it enjoyable, and uh, didn't mind listening to me rant about uh, video games again. Uh, I've got a couple more to cover, so I'll try to get to those in the next vid. Oh, I've got monsters on the way. I see you, spider. Die, little freak. There we go. Ah, skeleton. Eat arrow. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, you can pick up your own arrows. Button and safety. Well, all right. I will see you next time. Uh, enjoy your day or whatever. Goodbye.